All right, well, let's go right ahead and get started. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to today's program uh, to hear from Pulitzer Prize nominated writer and bird researcher, Scott Wiedensall, uh, as I hope I got that pronunciation right. Um, <laughs> it's okay. actually Wiedensall, but that's okay. <laughs> Wiedensall, excuse me. Um, and Scott is here to discuss his new uh, acclaimed book, A World on the Wing, Global Odyssey of Migratory Birds. Um, of course, we would love to be with you in person today uh, for this presentation, but we appreciate you adapting and joining us here on Zoom uh, instead. My name is Todd Martin. I'm the Grassroots Outreach Coordinator at the Natural Resources Council of Maine, and our CM is a nonprofit membership organization protecting, restoring, and conserving Maine's environment now and for future generations. For more than 60 years, NRCM as has helped protect the places and the way of life that make Maine such a special, special place to live, work, and play. And NRCM harnesses the power of the law, science, and the voices of more than 25,000 members and supporters who live in Maine, around the country, and around the world. Um, we have a staff of about 30, and our office is located in Augusta, just steps from the State House. Before we get started with today's program, uh, just a couple of notes about the Zoom webinar platform we're using today. Um, this program is being recorded, and tomorrow you'll receive an email with a link to watch the recording. We hope that you'll share that with friends and family who were unable to join us today. Um, your video and your audio is disabled today by design, so you'll only be able to hear and see our presenters. Um, but if you have any questions um, during the program, please feel free to type those questions in the Q&A box, which you can find on the lower ribbon of your Zoom screen. And we'll get to questions and answers uh, after Scott's presentation. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Allison Wells, uh, NRCM Senior Director of Communications and External Affairs to introduce Scott. So take it away, Allison. Thanks, thanks. Um, thanks, Todd. And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this exciting presentation by acclaimed author Scott Widensall, who will be giving us a glimpse into the mysterious and fascinating world of bird migration. Although I've never met Scott in person, I feel like I know him well, in part because he has collaborated on a number of projects with my husband, Jeff, but also because when it comes to birds, Scott's name is seemingly everywhere. Scott is the author of more than two dozen books on natural history, including the Pulitzer Prize finalist, Living on the Wind, and his latest, the New York Times bestseller, a, a World on the Wing. Scott contributes to just about every major publication out there, including Audubon Magazine, Birdwatcher's Digest, and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's Living Bird. He's also a fellow of the American Ornithological Society and an active field researcher studying Northern, uh, Northern Sawet owl migration for more than two decades, as well as winter hummingbirds and bird migration in Alaska, and the winter movements of snowy owls through Project Snowstorm which he co-founded. In fact, I believe, Scott, the snowy owl that you're holding in that publicity photo for this webinar is one that you radio tagged here in Maine. Right? It is. <laughs> well, we're fortunate. I hope we can hear more about that. Uh, we're very fortunate that Scott has a fondness for Maine birds. For decades, he's been teaching at uh, National Audubon's much-loved Hog Island Camp located in Muscongas Bay. Uh, and it is especially telling that when the late Peter Vickery, author of the groundbreaking new book, Birds of Maine, was diagnosed with terminal cancer, Scott was asked to be part of the team to see that book to completion. And I can attest firsthand to the incredible level of care that Scott put into helping make sure that book would be one of the best state bird books ever produced. Thank you, Scott, for all you do for birds. We are incredibly honored to have you with us here today, to discuss bird migration and conservation and your newest book, A World on the Wing. Well, thank you very much, Allison. Thank you very much, Todd. And uh, thank you, um, everybody with uh, NRCM for having me here today. Again, it's, it's, as Todd said, it's a shame we can't do this in person, but I appreciate the chance to, to come to you a little bit remotely from, uh, from our home in New Hampshire. And, and Allison, let me just, just pay the compliment back that uh, on, on the Birds of Maine side of things, working, working with Jeff and everybody else in the Birds of Maine team was uh, the honor of a lifetime. And it's just a shame that our dear friend Peter Vickery wasn't able to make it to the end to see the, the publication of that book. But let's talk about bird migration because it is the peak of bird migration season right now. We're in the, we're in the midst of fall migration. Um, in fact, I'm kind, of, I'm, I'm kind of tempted to ask everybody why on, why on earth they're on a Zoom instead of out birding today, but then I'd be guilty of the same thing. Um, I've been nuts about bird migration 
all my life and um, would like to share a little bit about um, what we've learned in recent years about bird migration, some of the challenges that migratory birds are facing, um, not just here in North America, but around the world. So give me just a second while we do the, um, you know, the, the um, screen sharing two-step here always takes a little bit of jumping around and you should be seeing a title slide right now. And if not, Todd or, or Allison can let me know. Yep, it's so, on the screen. Super, thank you very much. So, so I've been fascinated, as I said, I've been fascinated with, with bird migration my entire life. I grew up in the mountains of Eastern Pennsylvania, got hooked on watching hawks going past Hawk Mountain Sanctuary when I was about 12 years old. And it's really grown into the defining passion of, of both my personal and, and professional life. Um, as as uh, Allison mentioned, um, back in the 1990s, I spent pretty much six years traveling up and down the Western Hemisphere, looking at bird migration in North and South America for um, a book called Living on the Wind that came out in, in 1999. And, um, you know, in the years since then, we've, we've learned so much more about bird migration. We've learned more, so, so much more about the, the mechanics of migration, how birds are able to travel and, and, and cover these in, incredible distances, the, the physiology of migrating birds, um, you know, including a lot of secrets we'd like to crack for, for the benefits of human health. But my own, my own connection to bird migration, and especially bird migration research has changed. When I wrote Living on the Wind, in the mid 90s, I was doing a lot of raptor branding in those days, working uh, at a ridgetop station not too far from Hawk Mountain. Um, had started doing a little bit of, uh, of songbird banding, but I was very much writing that book as an outsider looking in, somebody who's a, uh, an interested, you know, pretty, pretty passionate lay person. I do not have any kind of an academic degree in science. But in the years since then, the decades since then, I've gotten much more directly involved in bird migration research. Allison outlined some of the research projects that my colleagues and I have been involved in around the country. And we've also discovered a great deal more about bird migration. Our sense of, of how birds are able to do what they do, the challenges that are facing them um, have grown much more, much sharper and more intense. And so over the last five or six years, I was back out on the road again um, on a global scale this time, working on, on this new book, uh, A World on the Wing, um, about the challenges that are facing migratory birds around the world, our greater understanding of the science behind them and the ways that we're you know, hopefully gonna be able to turn around some of the declines we've seen and, and restore these birds. Because migratory birds are in crisis. And I think that's not gonna be a surprise to probably anybody on this webinar today. Um, most of you have probably either read or heard about this bombshell paper that came out two years ago from um, a team of basically the top ornithologists in North America documenting the fact that since 1970, we've lost almost 3 billion birds out of North America's avifauna, almost a third of North America's avifauna. And I don't want to start out, start out here with a complete buzzkill, but I think it's important for us to understand um, how, how stark the stakes are right now for migratory birds. Um, and I, I promise you, I'm not going to show you a lot of graphs um, in, in today's program, but, but this one, this is one of the graphs from that paper in which they show the degree of decline broken down by, um, by habitat guild. And you can see that, you know, down there at the bottom, grassland birds are in the worst shape. Species like bobolinks, eastern meadowlarks, upland sandpipers, grasshopper sparrows. And, you know, it's not a mystery why this has happened. We have destroyed most of our natural grassland habitat here in North America. But there's actually a roadmap for recovery um, buried within that same graph. Because if you look at the other end of the graph, if you look up at the top, look what's happened to wetland birds over the last 50 years. At the same time, when almost every other group of bird was, was in decline, wetland birds like waterfowl, wading birds like ibis and, and herons and egrets have rebounded dramatically. And again, the reason for this is not a mystery. Um, starting in the 1980s, when waterfowl populations cratered from habitat loss and drought, we began investing serious money and serious political muscle into protecting and restoring wetland habitats. Now, you know, waterfowl have politically potent constituencies like waterfowl hunters. They've got a lot, of, a lot of money behind them. But the fact of the matter is that we can do the same thing for grassland birds, the group of birds that is in the deepest, darkest trouble right now in North America. If we put the same kind of concerted effort and political will and spending into restoring and protecting grassland habitats. Now that's not the only issue facing grassland birds, 
but habit, simple habitat loss is a big part of it. Not every challenge facing migratory birds is quite that straightforward, but we have to remember that we can change things for the better. And even though the situation can seem bleak all around the world, um, scientists and conservationists are making demonstrable progress on behalf of migratory birds. To guide that conservation work, um, we need a better picture of where and when and how birds are migrating, and we're getting it thanks to um, new technologies um, like uh, dramatically improved Doppler radar that's giving us kind of a minute by minute, square meter by square meter of, 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 sky, of sky view of what birds are up there and you know, what parts of, the, of, the, of the, um, the continent moving in what numbers. And we're tapping the promise of big data, you know, observational databases like eBird that are giving us an absolutely unprecedented notion of what species of birds are where and in what numbers um, as they move back and forth across the continent. And we're also using increasingly sophisticated, highly miniaturized tracking technology. This is something that I've been directly involved in for the last 20 years or so that's showing us, you know, even the smallest birds, even birds as small as the smallest warblers and hummingbirds, where these birds are traveling, on a second by second basis across landscape and even hemispheric distances. And not least of all, um, we're continually amazed by what we're learning about the physiological abilities of migratory birds. Some of which we now realize can go weeks or months without sleep, um, spend months or years on the, on the wing at a stretch without rest. Feats that seem almost, almost out of sci-fi, almost entirely unbelievable. And I'd like to start actually talking about by talking about um, migration endurance. Um, even the smallest migratory birds do amazing things. Um, this is a, a little semi-palmated sandpiper, um, you know, common bird along the coast of, of New England every year. Um, and as far as shorebirds go, you know, not a particularly long distance migrant, although only among shorebirds would we say that in the case of the semi-palmated sandpiper population that breeds in the Eastern and Central Canadian Arctic and flies 3,300 miles nonstop across the Western Atlantic to Northeastern South America, that that's not a particularly long journey. But of course, you know, there are some shorebirds that fly dramatically longer distances, but that is still the equivalent of a human being running 126 consecutive marathons without food or water or rest. You know, a couple of years ago, um, there was a marathon runner who broke the four hour record for, uh, for, for running a marathon. And, and he was, I think with justification, was hailed as, as superhuman which is true, but that's still distinctly subavian. And every time I hear birds compared to human athletes, I'm always slightly insulted on behalf of the birds. I mean, you think about the most elite human athletes, maybe a, you know, a, a, tour, a male Tour de France cyclist at peak condition. That's a person who's operating at four or five times his base metabolism and only capable of, of, of doing that for a relatively short period, five, six, seven hours, at a stretch and only with regular food and hydration. Compare that to a semi-palmated sandpiper, six inches long, weighs slightly more than an ounce. You know, it's flying for four or five days of continuous flight across a completely hostile environment, operating at eight or nine times its already high base metabolism. The body temperature is about 104 degrees compared to 98 for us. So when I hear talk about birds as, as athletes, I think, yeah, that, you know, but they put human athletes completely in the shade. But those semi-palmateds do have one trait in common with at least some human athletes. Um, the ones that stop off in the Bay of Fundy in Eastern Canada on their way south each fall, when the, of course, when the tide goes out in the Bay of Fundy, you have hundreds of thousands of acres of mudflats. And in those mudflats are tiny little crustaceans called corophium. And, um, the semi-palms will seek out and preferentially feed on corophium. And they do that not just because the, the corophium are nutritious, which they are, but because the corophium are high in omega-3 fatty acids. And consuming those fatty acids provides a metabolic aerobic boost to the bird's muscle. So basically what they're doing is juicing on performance enhancing drugs. The difference is what the bird's doing is legal. We've also been learning a great deal about how birds navigate. We've known for years that birds have this whole series of fallbacks that they can use when they're, when they're migrating and, and trying to orient and navigate across the landscape. They can use um, not, the, not so much the, the, the position and pattern of stars in the night sky, but the apparent rotation of the night sky around Polaris that gives them their compass points. 
Um, they can, you know, seabirds can smell their way back home across sometimes thousands of miles of ocean. Um, diurnal migrants like raptors will use uh, the position and apparent movement of the sun across the sky as to give them their, um, their, um, their, their position. But we've known for years and years, actually we've known since the 1850s that birds also have a magnetic sense. And that has always been the most mysterious of a bird's um, orientation cues. When I was in college in the 1970s and took ornithology, I was taught that birds had little deposits of magnetite crystals, ma magnetic iron crystals at the base of their bill or in their brain that basically functioned like a little compass and pulled their nose to the north. But it's way more complicated than that. In fact, we now know that the bird's magnetic sense depends on a form of quantum physics that is so strange that even though, even though it grew out of his own equations, Albert Einstein did not like it. He thought it was too weird. He called it spooky action at a distance. It's called quantum entanglement. And the way it works apparently is that as a migrant bird like the summer tanager is flying north, let's say across the, the Gulf of Mexico in the springtime, a photon of blue light that was emitted from a star maybe 10 million light years away enters the bird's eye and strikes a pigment molecule called cryptochrome in the bird's eye. And when it does, it knocks an electron out of that cryptochrome molecule and into the next cryptochrome molecule next to it. Those two molecules now have an unequal number of electrons and they have become what's known as a radical pair. They are quantumly entangled. And they also, for just a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second, become magnetized. So you have a pigment molecule that is magnetized in the eye of the bird. And so it appears that as these birds are flying through the Earth's magnetic field, it's generating waves of pigment in the bird's eye, this, these, these, these radical pairs again and again and again and again, allowing the bird to visualize the Earth's magnetic field. Um, quantum entanglement promises, at least according to the scientists, um, the development of faster than light communication and unhackable quantum computers. We think it's sci-fi. Birds have been using it in their eyes to migrate for probably millions of years. And back on the whole issue of, of birds as superb athletes, imagine a, um, an elite climber who's been laboring up the side of mm, K2 or, or Everest in the Himalayas, weeks on the mountain going from camp to camp, um, acclimating to different levels, different elevations, finally up in you know, 25,000 feet up in the um, in the death zone, barely dragging one foot in front of an, uh, in front of their other, in front of the other, and they look overhead and they see flocks of bar-headed geese and ruddy shell ducks and cranes flying, if not effortlessly, at least with a whole hell of a lot less effort, far overhead. These birds make extraordinary migrations from basically starting at sea level and flying more than thirty thousand feet over the top of the highest mountains on Earth and can do this at an, at, an, at an altitude where not only would exercise be difficult or impossible for a human, it would just flat out kill us. The reason they can do this is because any off the shelf bird has a dramatically more efficient respiratory system than a human. We have a tidal respiration system. We breathe in and back out along the same pathways. So we, don't, we don't extract very much oxygen from the air we breathe. Birds have a unidirectional um, uh, respiration system. They have a system of um, intricate air sacs connected to their, uh, to their lungs. And it actually takes four respirations, four intakes and outtakes of breath for a single breath to move through this entire system. So they're able to pull more than 90% of the oxygen from the air they breathe. breathe. Um, Bar-headed geese, which have been studied more closely than any of these other high elevation, high, or high altitude migrants, they have an unusually efficient respiration system. They also have unusually efficient hemoglobin pulling oxygen out of their lungs and carrying it through their blood to their tissues. Um, they seem to be immune to the effects of pulmonary embolism that kills a lot of people. We don't really know how they do that. But again, human physiologists are paying close attention to this because it may hold promise for, for changes in uh, the way we treat diseases in humans. All of which is amazing enough. But every time we think we understand what the physical limits of bird migration are, the birds just kind of blow right past them. For example, in 2013, researchers in Switzerland were studying alpine swifts like this one. Um, and they, they, they were curious about exactly where these swifts go in the wintertime. They knew they migrated to Africa, but they weren't sure exactly where they went when they were in Africa, they didn't know what routes they used. So they captured them, they fitted them with um, little backpacks with tiny little data loggers on them, 
um, that included a geolocator so that when the birds came back next year and they downloaded the data, they could see where exactly the birds had gone. And also tiny little accelerometers because they were interested in finding out how much of the, how much of the bird's day was spent flying, how much of the bird's day was spent resting. They had that information for the breeding grounds. They were interested in getting that for the wintering grounds. So they let these birds go. They flew off to, to Africa. They came back the next spring. They could see, oh yes, from the geolocator data, they're wintering in the, the bulge of Western Africa. But when they looked at the accelerometer data, their jaws dropped. Because according to the accelerometer data, these birds didn't stop flying for seven months. From the, from the time they left Switzerland until the time they got back the next spring, they never sat down and rested once, which is astonishing. But then two years later, scientists studying common swifts in Sweden did exactly the same experiment and found out that they spend 10 months on the wing, never resting, never stopping, never roosting, sleeping on the wing because they can put one half of their brain to sleep at a time for a couple of seconds at a, at a clip, what's known as unihemispheric sleep. And if we think that's amazing, consider the sooty tern, which breeds in tropical islands in the Pacific and the Caribbean. When a young sooty tern leaves its breeding island, it spends the next four or five years at sea. And this is a bird that can't rest on the water without becoming waterlogged. So sooty terns spend four or five years in continuous flight before they are old enough to come back to their breeding island and set foot on land again. Now, no bird can make an epic migration without the right resources at each end of the trip. And that's especially true for some of the most extraordinary long distance migrants like bar-tailed godwits, which uh, the population that breeds in, in Western uh, Alaska takes off and flies 7,700 miles nonstop across the widest part of the Pacific Ocean from Alaska to the North Island of New Zealand and the coast of Australia. That's an 11, up to an 11 day trip. And in the process, before they, they make that trip, they basically get rid of their digestive system. After they've gained an enormous amount of weight, laid on a tremendous amount of fat, they rapidly atrophy their stomach, their intestines, their kidneys, make this flight, regrow their guts as soon as they get to New Zealand and do this again and again and again throughout a life that might be 25 or 30 years. The reason they can do that is because they have extraordinarily rich resources in Alaska, extraordinarily rich estuarine resources in places like the Firth of Thames um, on the North Island of New Zealand, and on their return migration, leaving New Zealand and flying 6,000 miles to the Yellow Sea between China and the Korean Peninsula, where they land, regrow their guts, bulk up and pray, you know, guts shrink down again, they make another 4,000 mile trip, a mere 4,000 mile trip back to Alaska, 18,000 miles a year, basically connecting only three places on the Earth's surface and only possible because of the really rich marine resources at each of those three places. Without any one of those three spots, the whole system falls apart, which is why conservationists have been so concerned for so long about one of the places along not just the Bartel Godwitz route, but the route of some 11 to 13 million migrant shorebirds every year on the Yellow Sea between China and the Korean Peninsula. The mudflats along the Yellow Sea are the largest on earth. When the tide goes out at a place like Chazini here, on the Jiangsu coast uh, north of Shanghai, it goes out for like 20 kilometers. I've never seen such expansive mudflats. And what looks like a completely lifeless um, rock hard pan of, of mud is actually you know, under the surface, a stew of benthic organisms. The problem is that particularly in China and South Korea, as, met, as much as 60 or 70% of those mudflats have been destroyed in recent, in recent decades. They've been walled off with seawalls. They've been filled in um, with hundreds of millions of cubic meters of sediment to create dry land for industrial sites, uh, for cities, uh, for, for deep aquaculture lakes like those for jellyfish and shrimp, which are of no use to shorebirds because the water's way too deep, too deep for the shorebirds. We've gotten to a point on the Yellow Sea where in the words of one of the conservationists I know there, it's, he said it's a birds per hectare equation now. For every additional acre of land of mudflat that's reclaimed and destroyed, birds die because they simply have no other place to go. A couple of years ago, when South Korea built a 21 mile long seawall that blocked the tide from 150 square miles of formerly rich mudflat on which a fifth of the world's great knot population depended, a fifth of the world's great knots disappeared. They died. They disappeared because there was no other place for them to go. The poster child for Yellow Sea conservation, for shorebird conservation, um, has long been this bird. This is a spoonbilled sandpiper, the 
obviously, without doubt, the strangest of all of the world's um, shorebirds with that weird spatulate build. Also one of the world's most endangered birds of any sort. Only between 200 and 600 of them left. They breed in the, the Russian Far East. They winter in Southeast Asia. And twice each year, they utterly and completely depend on the mudflats along the Yellow Sea, especially in their fall migration when they stop there for several weeks to feed and, and molt their feathers. It's become the poster child for Yellow Sea um, conservation thanks to conservationists like Jing Li, um, a Chinese conservationist who founded a small nonprofit called Spoonbilled Sandpiper in China, and my friend Dr. Tunis Piersma from the Netherlands. That's, that's Tunis there with the long gray hair with one of his um, Chinese grad students, Big Run Zhu. Um, Tunis is He's basically Dr. Shorebird. And they're, what they're actually looking at there are a race of um, red knots that are named for him, Calidrus canutus pyrismaei. Um, and they've been laboring for years to bring the plight of the shorebirds of the Yellow Sea to the attention of the Chinese government and the world community. And it worked. Just before my visit to the Yellow Sea in the spring of 2018, the Chinese government um, issued a sweeping ban on all further coastal reclamation along the Yellow Sea coast, um, which was being driven for the most part by, um, by local um, development uh, for industrial sites and, and shrimp farms. They also nominated um, about, a million, about a half a million acres um, of the best shorebird sites for UNESCO World Heritage Protection. And last year nominated a further dozen, dozen and a half sites for about 600,000 additional acres for additional UNESCO World Heritage Site Foundation or Protection. So it was funny when I, when I was in China in 2018, talking to people like Jing and Tunis, they found themselves grappling with an unfamiliar emotion, hope. But coastal development is not the only problem facing migratory birds um, in China. Um, one of the reasons the, the, the spoon-billed sand type piper is so critically endangered is because of illegal hunting in Southeast Asia um, for, for the pot, people shooting them and trapping them for food. And that's not a problem that's restricted simply to, um, to Asia. Um, for example, some of the worst illegal bird trapping for food occurs in the Mediterranean basin, along flyways that are used by Eurasian um, African migrants like this female Eurasian black cat. And some of this is happening in places um, like Egypt where about five and a half million birds are killed. And these, I'm talking here mostly about songbirds um, that are being killed every year for food. Um, Lebanon, about two and a half million, Syria, about 3.9 million. But it's not just in, you know, kind of lawless, unprotected areas like the Middle East. About half a million protected birds are killed illegally in France every year, critically endangered ortolan buntings, various species of thrushes. And the worst, most dangerous place in the entire Mediterranean basin to be a migratory songbird is actually Italy. About 5.6 million birds killed every year illegally against against EU regulations in Italy every year. In all, about 11 to 36 million birds are killed for the pot every year in the Mediterranean basin. And I wanna stress that for the most part, this is not subsistence hunting. This is not people putting food on the table to feed their kids. Um, particularly in France and Italy and elsewhere in Europe, this is um, traditional hunts um, that, uh, that people do because it's fun and because they like to eat small birds. But in per capita terms, both from a, a population and a land area perspective, the black hole of the Mediterranean, in the words of one conservationist I met, is the island of Cyprus, about the size of the state of Connecticut um, in the Eastern Mediterranean, just south of Turkey. Every year, about two and a half to three million songbirds are killed in Cyprus um, illegally. And the way they were traditionally killed, the way they were traditionally hunted and caught was a technique known as lime sticking, L-I-M-E. Um, it has nothing to do with little green fruit that you cut up and put in your beer. Um, it comes from an old Indo-European word that means sticky or gum-like. And they use the fruit of Syrian plums, which I was not sufficiently warned how god-awfully difficult it was going to be to get this stuff off my fingers. But they mix that up with honey and other ingredients. They, they boil it up and they form a glue that they smear on sticks and then put those sticks within trees and shrubs where birds like this male Eurasian black cap are going to, to fly. And if they touch just the tip of a beak or toe or wingtip to, the, to, the, to the, the lime, they are stuck fast. And the point here in Cyprus, as in much of the rest of the Mediterranean, is a dish that the Cypriots call umbilopulia, which are small, um, whole, 
fall fattened songbirds, in this case, black caps that are, that are sauteed up with a little bit of oil and salt and then munched down whole. You bite off the head and you crunch the whole rest of it, guts and bones and everything else. And I apologize if you're eating lunch right now. Um, and again, this is not subsistence hunting. Um, a plate of Ambalapulia um, from a, a black market uh, restaurant will set you back 60 to 80 euros, 80 to 100 dollars. Most of the trapping that's occurring in Cyprus today is not being done with lime sticks. It's mostly um, connected with organized crime. It is industrial scale bird poaching using hundreds of meters of mist nets, um, audio lures to pull these birds in as they're migrating at night. And until recently, the worst of the trapping was occurring on two large British controlled military bases in Southern Cyprus, Cyprus where for a variety of political reasons, the Brits were turning a blind eye to it. But thanks to international pressure that has changed, um, I had a chance to spend time in the field with uh, the, um, the Cypriot um, uh, base police force, the, the anti-poaching force. Um, they're up against organized crime. And in Cyprus, that means people who like to use explosives. So I've, I've pixelated their faces here for their own safety. It's the only, the only time in my life I've been asked what size bulletproof vest I take. Um, they'd had a grenade attack on one of their, their headquarters not too long before I was there, but they're using sophisticated drones fitted with infrared um, to get video surveillance uh, footage um, to prosecute uh, these, these trappers, um, surveillance cameras hidden through, uh, through the woods there, and it's been dramatically effective. Uh, a couple of years before I was there, they had more than 80 active trapping operations on the bases. Um, when I was there in the fall of 2018, they were down to just two, which were under constant surveillance. They were ready to move in and, and arrest these guys and prosecute them. They have a 100% prosecution success rate there. Um, it's been, a, it's been a, a, a tremendous move for the, for the good on the birds, uh, for the birds in Cyprus. But I wish that all of the problems facing migratory birds were as straightforward and easy to confront as poaching. I mean, poaching is basically just a law enforcement issue. You know, you can, you, can, you can stop bird poaching if you want to. Climate change is without doubt um, the single biggest and most challenging issue facing, facing migratory birds. And I pause for just a second here because I've got a dry spot in my throat and I need to take a drink. Pardon me. We know that, that, that climate change is affecting bird migration. I mean, we're seeing that anybody, anybody who birds is seeing that quite frankly. Um, you know, we've seen by analyzing Christmas bird count data from the National Audubon Society that the range of the, the, the center of winter abundance and the winter range of hundreds of species of North American birds has shifted dramatically to the North. And we also know looking at long-term data sets like that at Mohunk House in upstate New York that dates back more than a century, that some species are now arriving up to two weeks earlier in the spring and leaving as much as two weeks later in the fall, which is obviously encouraging. You know, some birds are showing some plasticity in the face of climate change. But these are mostly, when you look a little more deeply into the numbers, the birds that are showing that plasticity are for the most part, short and moderate distance migrants. Species like Eastern towhees and fox sparrows and brown thrashers and Eastern phoebes that for the most part winter within the United States or maybe Northern Mexico. They can tell, if you're a fox sparrow wintering in Georgia, you can tell if it is a late cold winter with one cold front after another marching down from the north that's gonna delay your migration, or an early warm spring with one warm front after another. If you look at the migration timing for long distance migrants, like neotropical um, warbler migrants, like this black footed green warbler, they are coming back to Maine and to places in the Northeast on average to the day when they did a century ago. But we know that spring is coming earlier and earlier. The seasons are advancing rapidly. And what's happening is these birds are getting farther and farther out of sync with the seasons every year. And if we want to understand what that potentially could lead to, all we have to do is look across the Atlantic to the fate of, um, one of the, what had been one of the most abundant and widespread birds in Western and Central Europe, the pied flycatcher. Pied flycatchers are a, a trans-Saharan migrant. They winter in sub-Saharan Africa. They've got a grueling migration. They have to cross first the Sahara Desert and then the Mediterranean Sea to get back to, uh, to Europe, to the hardwood forests of Europe. And they time their migration traditionally so that they're coming back in time to set up a territory, find a mate, find a nest site. They're a, they're a cavity nesting old world flycatcher, lay their eggs, incubate their chicks and have their chicks hatch out so that they're at their hungriest when the peak in the caterpillar population in the hardwood forests of Europe 
um, reaches its crescendo because it's going to take about 6,000 caterpillars to feed a nest of four little baby pied flycatchers. The problem is the pied flycatchers are coming back on their traditional schedule, whereas the springs in spring weather in Europe has gotten earlier and earlier. So they've, they've fallen so far out of sync with the seasons that their populations are collapsing. They've dropped by more than 50% in the UK and in some parts of mainland Europe, like the Netherlands, they've dropped by as much as 90%. Now we haven't seen that kind of severe mismatch with our migrant songbirds here in North America yet. And there may be a couple of reasons for that. For one thing, our songbirds don't have to travel quite as far. Most of our neotrop migrants are wintering in the Caribbean and Southern Mexico or Northern Central America. So it's, a, it's an easier, shorter flight for them. They're not crossing first a desert and then an ocean. And also we have, we have a much more diverse Lepidoptera fauna in the forests, especially in the Northeast. Um, you know, Hubbard Brook in New Hampshire, they've got more, more than 400 species of moths and butterflies. So instead of having this very, very sharp, um, um, you know, temporarily compact peak like you have in caterpillar numbers in Europe. It's much more of a plateau. So there may be a little bit more wiggle room for them there. But that's not to say that we have not seen serious climate change impacts on migratory birds in North America. You know, one of the weird things about climate change is it doesn't just make everything uniformly warm everywhere at an even rate. Some places get warmer faster than others. Some places actually get colder at certain times of the year. And that's been happening in the Eastern and Central Canadian Arctic, the same area that those semi-palmated sandpipers I mentioned before breed. In that part of, of Canada, late winter and early spring are actually becoming dramatically colder and snowier, even though summer has become dramatically warmer. So for long distance migrant shorebirds like redneck phalaropes that winter off the Pacific coast of South America, um, Hudsonian godwits that winter in Southern, in southern South America, um, semi-pollinated sandpipers that, 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 that winter along the northeastern South American coast. These birds are coming back on their, on their normal timetable and they get there and they can't breed because it's cold and snowy, much more so than, than usual. And they have to wait and wait. And then finally, they, you know, things open up and thaw out. They can lay their eggs. They can start producing their chicks. But then, bam, the climate shifts and it becomes dramatically warmer. And the insects on which their chicks depend, because after all, shorebird chicks come out of the egg able to move around and feed themselves. They have to be able to catch their own insect food. Those insects are actually emerging earlier than they did because it's so much dramatically hotter at the beginning of the summer. So by the time these shorebird chicks are at their hungriest, the insect peak is already gone. And so for many years, Hudsonian godwits, for example, only have a, a nesting success rate of about 6%. Because these are long-lived birds, we haven't been seeing big dramatic population declines in them yet. But year after year, if we continue to see um, poor reproduction, they're gonna fall off a cliff. So the challenges that are facing migratory birds are huge and, and migration, it's still the black box of a bird's annual cycle. It's the part of a bird's annual cycle about which we know the least, but which we also know is, is the most dangerous part, You know, the greatest mortality to migratory birds occurs during migration. We, if we're gonna have a prayer of, of saving and restoring migratory birds, we need to understand what's happening during migration. And fortunately, we are, we're developing techniques and tools and technologies, maybe just in the nick of time, that are giving us a window into, into migration and uh, the information that we're going to need. You know, back in the 1980s, when the National Weather Service rolled out the Doppler radar Weather, weather radar network. They did not do this to help ornithology, but oh my God, what a boon this has been for ornithology. Because of course, Doppler radar shows everything that's in the air, not just rain and snow, but also migrating birds. And so you can see as, as with this map, you know, all of those um, Doppler radar sites across Eastern and Central North America lit up like a Christmas tree as hundreds of millions of migratory birds are in the air. And the same thing's going on in the West, but because of topography out there, it doesn't show up as well. And a few years ago, when the National Weather Service rolled out dual polarization radar, which, you know, it's, it's designed to tell the difference between ice crystals and snowflakes and water droplets. So it has no problem telling you exactly how many birds per cubic kilometer of airspace are up over North America every night. So that we can say with, with absolute precision that some nights there are as many as three quarters of a billion birds moving overhead. 
And because we now have the raw computing power to take all of the archived weather radar data stretching back decades, we can, we basically, we have a time machine that allows us to see how migration has changed week to week, month to month, year to year, decade by decade, um, since the radar um, system was, was first rolled out, which is why we can say with a great deal of precision and confidence that we have lost 2.9 billion birds in North America in the last 50 years. That's based in large part on our understanding um, of how migration has changed thanks to radar. But radar is, as, as one radar expert likes to say, taxonomically agnostic. Um, you can't identify birds on radar. You can tell small birds from medium-sized birds from large birds, but you can't tell what species they are. In order to do that, to paint the details in, you need another arm of big data, which is eBird. Um, it has grown in you know, less than 20 years into the largest wildlife observational database in the world. And if you look at something, you know, the, the, the information we're getting from eBird, you look at, for example, the way um, we can model the movements and migration and abundance densities for species like yellow warblers. It's just extraordinary. And this is thanks to millions of birders pumping hundreds of millions of, um, of observations into the eBird database on a monthly basis. eBird just exceeded a billion observations since it began. And it's turned into an extraordinarily um, effective and important tool for understanding where birds are and in what numbers so we can figure out where to put our conservation money and our conservation effort. And it's leading to some really good on the ground conservation successes. Um, for example, um, Nature Conservancy, Conservancy scientists in the Central Valley of California a couple of years ago realized that they could take eBird data that told them exactly what species of shorebirds were passing through the Central Valley at exactly what time of the year and combine that with high resolution satellite imagery from NASA and radar, radar data that's telling them exactly where the birds are moving right now. Um, and they, they realized they could pay farmers relatively small amounts of money to flood their rice fields to precise depths at precise times for just long enough to provide tens of thousands of acres of what they call pop-up wetlands just when these birds need it, just long enough, just while the birds are there, and then it can go away again. And they can do this for a fraction of the amount of money that it would cost them to buy that land and permanently protect it as conservation land. And again, we don't have that much money, unfortunately, for bird conservation. So we gotta be really smart about how we use it. eBird and radar have also shown how dramatically light pollution from urban metropolitan areas draws birds into these metro areas, especially young birds on their first migration south. I mean, these are birds that evolved to, to navigate using starlight. Um, but using artificial intelligence and radar allows us to do something to save those birds. We can create automated um, uh, you know, warning systems, basically, so that um, you know, we can predict that day after tomorrow in, in New York or Chicago or Cleveland is going to be a massive migration night. We know from migration data from eBird and radar that the, the, the great majority of migration through any particular metropolitan area happens on only just one or two nights in the spring and the fall. So if we can get people to turn out their lights, building owners and municipal leaders to turn out lights and skyscrapers, um, just for those couple of nights, we can save a ton of birds. But we know that birds are going to be pulled into metropolitan areas anyway. So what we probably should be doing is putting at least some of our conservation funds into restoring and enhancing bird habitat in urban green spaces and urban parks, which are for the most part just, just managed for, um, for human recreation. There's no reason why we can't have both because those urban parks are life rafts for millions of birds that otherwise would not be able to make it. We're also benefiting from an explosion in new tracking technology. And as I said before, this is something I've been privileged to, to, to work on for, uh, for, for much of the last 20 years. And it's some pretty exciting stuff. Allison mentioned um, Project Snowstorm, which some colleagues of mine and I started about seven or eight years ago, where we've been um, putting GPS GSM transmitters on the backs of, at this point, more than 90 snowy owls in 14 states from um, the Great Plains all the way up into New England and, and, uh, and Southeastern Canada. And if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about, um, about what we're doing and including some of the owls that we've tagged in Maine, like Brunswick, the, the bird that Allison mentioned, just go to www.projectsnowstorm.org. But these are pretty big transmitters. They're about the size of a matchbox. They weigh about 45 grams, less, still well less than 3% of the bird's body weight, but they've got 
a cell phone modem so that they can send us, I get text messages from snowy owls because I get text messages whenever we get data dumps from them via the cell phone network. They're communicating with the GPS satellite system overhead. They got temperature sensors and accelerometers and all kinds of other stuff. That works really well if you're studying a bird that weighs four and a half to six pounds. But most migratory birds are a lot smaller than that. And until recently, it's been impossible to, tr to track those birds across landscape distances with any efficiency at all. But now, thanks to something called the MODIS Wildlife Tracking System, which is a, a brainchild of Birds Canada, we are able to do this with even the smallest migrants, not just the smallest migrants, birds like warblers and hummingbirds, but actually monarch butterflies, and green, green darner dragonflies. What we're doing here is combining extraordinarily miniaturized VHF radio transmitters, some of them that weigh less than one two hundredth of a gram, along with automated receiver stations that, as you can see, basically look like somebody forgot to take down their old-fashioned radio antenna or television antenna. And these things are popping up all across, um, increasingly across the world, but predominantly in North America and um, Latin America. There's now about 1,300 of these um, MODIS stations. Um, by the way, MODIS um, is from a Latin word meaning Latin, or meaning movement. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not an acronym that stands for anything. Um, I've been involved for the last seven or eight years with something called the, the Northeast MODIS Collaboration, and we've been primarily interested in erecting um, a network of receiver stations initially across uh, the Mid-Atlantic region. We put about 100 up um, from Maryland and Delaware up into New York State, and now with um, a large U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service grant, we're doing the same thing in New England. We're putting about um, 15 MODIS stations up in the interior of New England. There's already a fair, fair number along the coast. And um, if you're interested in what this is tracking, it's mind-blowing. Um, at this point, something like 30,000 um, birds, bats, and bugs have been tagged with MODIS tags. And all of the tracking data for those animals is publicly accessible. If you just go to www.modis.org, you can see, for example, um, you know, these are the tracks of common nighthawks that one of my former owl banding volunteers who's now doing her PhD work in Ontario um, has been tracking on their, on their way to South America. Um, you can generate maps exactly like this if you're interested in particular species, if you're interested in, in particular projects. I, I highly encourage you to, to, to seek it out. Um, and you can, you can look up any of the sites um, in, the, in the state of Maine that are online and see what's been flying past them. It's really hopeful that we have um, this, this new technology that's giving us a, a window into migration at a time when, as I said at the beginning, you know, this, is really, this is really crunch time for migratory birds. Sometimes it seems like the hardest thing to find in bird migration is hope. The challenges are so huge, um, they're so daunting, it can really be easy to despair. Which is why I wanna leave you here with one final story that I think summarizes a lot of the challenges facing migratory birds, shows how extraordinary they can be, but also shows you what even the poorest people in some of the most remote places on earth can do to save and protect migratory birds. And so I wanna take you to easily the most remote place I have ever visited, the mountains of Nagaland in um, that little tiny thumb of India that sticks up between Myanmar and China. Every year, millions of Amur falcons, about the size of American kestrels, um, which are en route from their breeding grounds in Northern Asia, in Siberia, Northern China, and Mongolia, to their wintering grounds in Southern Africa, gather in this, this ruggedly mountainous remote part of India. And these are largely insectivorous falcons, and they're gathering there because they're feeding on um, the great mating flights of trillions of termites that emerge from underground in the wake of the seasonal monsoon rains. And they need the fat they get from eating those termites because they have the longest migration of any raptor on earth, more than 18,000 miles, and by far the longest overwater crossing. These birds fly 2,400 miles from, um, from India to the Horn of Africa every year. And so, as I said, they gather in, in Nagaland, in this remote, um, uh, and, and I have to say politically troubled part of India, um, Nagaland has been trying to break away from the rest of India since the 1940s. It's um, the site of the longest running guerrilla war in Asia. It's been going on for more than 80 years. Um, you know, just to the north is land that India and China have gone to war over in the past and almost did another uh, just, just a couple of years ago. Nagaland was closed to all outsiders, including other Indians, for many, many, many years. 
And even today, um, it requires jumping through a lot of hoops and getting a lot of specialized government permits in order to visit Nagaland. Well, the reason we're talking about Nagaland is because of the woman there on the right. Uh, her name is Bono Haralu, and she is a, a former print and television journalist who came back to her native Nagaland a few years ago to start a small conservation trust. And in the fall of 2012, she and her colleagues from Conservation India set out for a remote part of central Nagaland to investigate reports that she'd had of mind-bogglingly big numbers of falcons, which they found. But what they also found horrified them. They discovered that villagers in the little village of Pangti and some of the surrounding communities were killing about 140,000 of these falcons during the 10-day peak of the migration every fall. Now, I want to stress, this was not a traditional hunt. Um, this is not subsistence hunting. This is something that they had not been doing until just about 10 years earlier, when the Indian government built a huge hydroelectric dam along the Doyon River, and these falcons, which had always been passing through in great numbers, began gathering in astoundingly dense nighttime roosts of tens to hundreds of thousands of birds packed into small areas of forest every night. And the villagers thought, why not? They started stretching their, their fishing nets in the trees, catching these birds by the, the tens and hundreds of thousands, killing them, smoking them, and then selling them for cash in the larger towns and cities elsewhere in Nagaland. Um, given the fact that the, the, the hydroelectric dam had flooded their farm fields, um, and also given the fact that these, this, the population here is 95% Baptist, they literally saw this as manna from heaven. Well, as you can imagine, when the word got out in the fall of 2012, there was international outrage, there was international disgust, and a, and a great deal of concern, because Amor falcons are a common bird, but they're not so abundant that they could withstand that kind of slaughter year after year. But then a remarkable thing happened, um, in part because of increased law enforcement. I mean, the slaughter was technically illegal, but the authorities have been turning a blind eye to it for a long time, but mostly because of a massive conservation education effort and a genuine realization among the Naga villagers that um, what they were doing was threatening the falcons, they stopped completely one year to the next. 140,000 dead falcons one year, virtually none the next year. And within a year or two, the world went from condemning them um, to praising them for this, this, this remarkable change in Nagaland. But part of the reason the Naga had turned so easily from hunting is because they were told, and this is true, this is one of the greatest wildlife spectacles on earth, and people are going to want to come here to see this. Tourists are going to want, here to, going to, want to come here to see this. You can, make money, you can make more money from tourism than you can from, from hunting falcons which is true if the tourists can actually get there. But this is a very remote, very difficult place to reach. And I couldn't help but wonder what happens when very poor people do the right thing for the right reason, but expecting a particular outcome that may be a long time in materializing. So in the fall of 2017, along with a couple of friends um, from the US, I headed to Nagaland um, to see for myself. And I am here to tell you, it is not an easy place to get to. These are, without doubt, the worst roads I have ever been on in a lifetime of traveling on some pretty god-awful roads in remote parts of the world. That is an active landslide zone right there. Every time the mountain would slip and take another chunk of the road away, they would simply bulldoze another road through. And I, I should point out that the slope continued for about another 150 or 200 feet below that picture. Um, it was terrifying. We were also told repeatedly, don't be on the road after dark because of the danger of bandits and cross-border Maoist insurgents coming in from Myanmar, who, by the way, are also Baptists because that is the fundamentally strange aspect of, of Nagaland. But we did eventually reach Pangti before dark, which, like most Naga villages, is built on high defensible ridgetops because through at least the middle of the 20th century and perhaps in some places as late as the 1980s, they were still involved in intertribal warfare and taking trophy heads. These were, yes, Baptist headhunters. Nagaland is without doubt the, the most unusual and fascinating place I've visited. But they were not kidding when they said it was the spectacle of a lifetime. To watch 60, 70, 80, 100,000 falcons rising up at daybreak out of these roost sites, um, I've seen some of the greatest raptor concentrations on the planet and nothing I've ever seen quite compares 
to not own it. It really is worth the effort to get there. And one of the reasons that my friends and I made this trip in 2017 was to find out whether it was possible to bring American um, tour groups in there to see them. Um, but as I said, I was interested in what happens when people turn away from slaughter um, for conservation, but expect a particular outcome. Um, at, the, at the height of the, of the falcon kill, every household in the village, all 500 households, um, benefited economically from, um, from the falcon kill. And most of them were using that money to send their kids to school. Now, for some people, like Nchumo Odoyu, who's a former trapper, um, he gave up money from trapping, but now guides visitors. He's a, he's a, he's a really superb birder. Um, so he's making back the same kind of money that he got as a falcon trapper. His extended family owns some of the property where one of the big falcon roosts lies. And so they've built a, a watchtower and they've, um, they make a little money from, uh, from visitors. A few of the families in the village have had the wherewithal to install um, Western style toilets in their homes so they can um, rent their homes out as a homestay. But most of the families in the village are not benefiting economically from the new falcon economy. There've been enormous strides for conservation in Nagaland in a short time. Um, the pandemic has obviously um, dealt a real setback to this. I'm not concerned um, in the long run about a return to um, massive uh, falcon hunting. The authorities will never allow that to happen, but I do worry that the pandemic and the difficulties of tourism are gonna make it really difficult for, um, for conservation to make long-term strides there. But still, I don't wanna, I don't wanna understate what an extraordinary thing the communities of Nagaland have done for the Amar falcon. This ranks as one of the, the most striking migratory bird success stories I've, I've ever been privileged to report on. At least here, at least now, at least for this, this one precious species, the world is a safer place. And they're all precious. Every bird that makes that leap into the void is at once utterly ordinary and extraordinary, shaped by millions of generations of natural selection uh, propelled south by an act of faith buried deep in their bones um, and doing it for all of these all of these eons on the strength of their own muscles and their own wings that's always been enough but not anymore now it's up to us and so with that i will i'll wrap things up here i realize we're getting close to the top of the hour and i'm going to stop sharing my screen um, I am happy to stay on and answer, answer questions as long as folks want to pose them. Um, and uh, I want to say again to Todd and Allison and uh, NR, uh, NRCM, thank you very much for having me and, 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 and thank you very much for all the work you do on behalf of Maine's natural heritage. Well, thanks very much, Scott, for that excellent presentation um, and for your kind words about the work that we do at NRCM. Um, we are uh, almost at the top of the hour, but, um, but we have uh, 10 or 15 minutes to answer folks' questions. Um, again, if folks have questions from Scott's presentation, um, please type those questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. There's a few questions here that we'll start with, but uh, we've got plenty of time for questions if, if you have some. Um, so Scott, this first question comes from Michael San Filippo, um, who asks, uh, who determined that birds use quantum entanglement to navigate and what kinds of experiments were conducted to confirm this? Experiments well above my pay grade, I can tell you that. The interesting story here is the guy that first came up with this idea was a German physicist named Klaus Schulten back in the 1970s. Um, and he, he was curious about, he's not a, he wasn't a birder, he wasn't an ornithologist, but he was curious about um, magnetic reception, mag, mag, uh, mag, magnetoreception in general in organisms, because it's not just birds, red spotted newts, bumblebees, bacteria, lots of different organisms have a magnetic sense. And we've known for a very long time that all of them lose that magnetic sense if they're exposed to wavelengths of yellow and especially red light. So it was obviously something having to do with the visual system. And so he proposed that this radical pair theory would explain, could provide a pathway toward explaining a magnetic reception sense, but he was unable to provide, because nobody knew of it, um, a, um, a pigment molecule within the eye of a bird that would be magnetically sensitive. And, but he, he wrote a paper in the 1970s that kind of laid out the theory behind this, had it summarily rejected by several journals, finally had it, it was finally printed in a small, fairly obscure German um, physics journal. 
Well, um, it, it was it apparently, apparently biologists don't read physics journals very often because the paper was ignored for decades. Um, but within the last 10 years or so, scientists circled back around to it. And a lot of the work on this has been done at the, at the Max Planck Institutes in Germany. Um, and, and again, I, I, I cannot begin to explain to you exactly what the experiments were um, in, in detail, how they were able to, to confirm this. But there was a paper published earlier this year that in the opinion of quantum physicists and ornithologists alike kind of puts, kind of puts the nail in this one that yes, it really is um, you know, this crypto, one version of these cryptochrome molecules operating in a, in a quantumly entangled way. The interesting thing is the, the aspects of quantum entanglement that really get human scientists excited apparently don't really have much of an impact on why birds are using these quant. It's the fact that these quantumly entangled pairs become um, uh, magne magnetized for just a fraction of a second is what makes it work for birds as they're flying through the magnetic field. And by the way, they're not looking, they're not seeing the magnetic field in terms of polarity, north, south, east, west. It allows them to visualize the strike angle from at the angle at, from the Earth's surface at which the, um, the bands of, 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 of magnetic energy are, are emerging. So that tells them basically how far or close they are from the equator. Um, but you know, you know what I would give Todd to be able to see the Earth's magnetic field? It must be an amazing thing. And you know, every every yellow rump warbler flying north and south along the coast of Maine this fall can probably see it, and we can. That's pretty incredible. Um, this next question comes from Esperanza. Um, the question is: What are the current conditions and effects of climate change, specifically on albatross? Ooh, okay. I'm not an albatross expert. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have to wing this one a little bit. As I actually just in the Galapagos Islands about a month and a half ago, looking at waved albatrosses down there. Um, you know, the big, the big issue for any seabird, I think in terms of climate change, it's fair to say, is how changing sea surface temperatures and ocean currents are affecting, um, uh, affecting their food supplies. Um, but I, you know, I would, I'd, I'd really just kind of be speculating on, on albatrosses in particular, because that's unfortunately just not, not an area I have a lot of expertise in. We'll move on to the next question. Um, next question is from Christine, who asked, what might be a great recent success story uh, of bird restoration here in Maine? And that's Christine calling in from Sedgwick, Maine today. Well, I would say, um, well, in terms of recent, I mean, the, all the work that's been done um, along the main coast with seabird restoration, uh, bringing back, you know, not just not just puffins, but but the seabird colonies, and recognizing the impact that has had worldwide, because the the techniques of social attraction using decoys and audio lures and mirror boxes and all these other, you know, cool, fun ways of of fooling seabirds into thinking there's a big thriving seabird colony where there isn't has been exported all over the world. There are now hundreds and hundreds of projects on threatened and endangered seabirds all over the world that have used techniques that were pioneered out at Eastern Egg Rock and on other islands along the coast of Maine. I mean, in terms of, in terms of Maine's impact on bird conservation, um, it's, it's kind of hard to overstate how important that has been. Now, I mean, in terms of other bird restoration, um, there are, 810,000% more wild turkeys in the state of Maine today than there were in 1970, according to breeding bird survey data, and 46,000% more Canada geese. And whether, whether you like Canada geese or not, it's going to depend on whether you consider that a success story or not. Um, you know, some, some birds, all they need is a little bit of a, of a helping hand. Um, I think we're, you know, we're Maine, and, and this is something that, you um, you know, Allison's husband, Jeff, and, and my colleagues, the other colleagues on the Birds of Maine book project, um, you know, we, dr we drove this home again and again. Maine has such important conservation responsibility for so many species of northeastern forest songbirds. I mean, Maine has 19% of the world's population of black-throated blue warblers, for example. It's an enormous percentage in a, in a you know, relatively small area. Um, and so, you know, Protecting and, and protecting and enhancing, um, you know, forest habitats across Maine is going to be increasingly important um, for the for the survival of these birds. Um, but we're also understanding, I think, at a at a more uh, a more nuanced level, 
that um, you know, the forests that we have in the east and the northeast are not necessarily the forests that we need to best advantage for these birds. You know, we're finding that, you know, we've, we've run really low on, on early successional habitats in many, many areas. And for even for many deep forest dwelling nesting songbirds, um, you know, they, we're learning that a lot of those birds move out of deep forest habitats um, with their fledglings and into early successional habitat for the, the weeks just before migration as they bulk up. And, you know, we may need to start looking at Maine's forests from a, a more, comprehensive, more comprehensive view of their structural complexity, because right now what we tend to have are really big blocks of fairly even age forest. And it's not just in Maine, that's, that's all across all of Eastern North America. Um, and we, you know, we may need to start more actively creating the kind of complex mosaics of different successional stages um, that these birds need at different times in their life cycle. Great, thank you for that. Um, this next question, uh, it comes from um, uh, Zam, uh, Zam Donnell. Uh, and the question is, how do birds who fly for months at a time feed themselves? Oh, um, that's a great they, question. How, Right, I should, have, I should have made that a little bit clearer. So the birds that are flying for months at a time are birds that are able to eat on the wing. So for example, you know, swifts, if, if swifts could figure out how to incubate an egg on the wing, they would never land. I mean, that's basically the only reason they come into land because they're feeding on, on aerial insects, just swooping them out of, out of the air. Um, and it, it, it now appears that many of these swifts um, at night will go very, very high up and they're, and they're drifting along hundreds or thousands of feet above the ground. Sooty terns, you know, they're feeding on zooplankton in the, in the oceans, in the upper level of the, the ocean. So they're, they're, they're plucking fish and squid and, and other organisms off the surface. They just don't have to land to do it. So the birds that are spending weeks or months on the wing at a time are birds that are, um, that are able to feed on the wing. Excellent. Um, next question is, comes from John Taylor. Question is, does restoration of large predator birds um, like bald eagles uh, affect other bird populations negatively? <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah, there's all kinds of ripple effects with that. Um, and bald eagles, in, bald eagles in Maine are a really good example of how complicated this can get. Um, you know, there's now what, something like 800 pairs of bald eagles nesting in Maine, many of them along the coast. Um, they've increased their predation on common eiders, which is not good for common eiders, which are already suffering from declining populations, but they've also increased their predation on great blackback gulls, which um, great blackback gulls eat an awful lot of eider chicks. So, you know, there's some, there's some balance there. Um, bald eagles have, have become a real problem at some of the seabirds, some of the managed seabird colonies. And in fact, one of the reasons that the National Audubon Society has biologists on many of these seabird islands during the breeding season is partly to keep eagles away. Um, you know, now of course, there, there was a time when there were no biologists on, bio, on, on islands along the coast of Maine, but there were an awful lot more sea breeding, um, uh, breeding colonies out there. If the eagles knocked one out one year, the birds could just shift somewhere else. We've got fewer opportunities for those birds and, and more reasons to manage them. But yes, eagles, Eagles have had some real, some real impacts. Like for example, um, this is not Maine, but on the, on the coast of Alaska, um, where Kitlitz's murelets commute 60 miles from the ocean to, the, to high alpine glaciers where they lay their single egg on a rock in the high alpine glaciers, they commute back and forth every day with fish, which puts them at risk from peregrine falcons, which are the only birds fast enough to catch them. Bald eagles have moved into those fjords as the glaciers have retreated and, and trees have grown up. They can't catch the murelets, but they can steal the murelets from the falcons, which have tripled the number of murelets they're catching just in order to keep their chicks fed because the eagles are taking so many of them. So the murelet populations are going down as eagle populations are going up. So yeah, it's complicated. Um, you know, that's, that's the beauty and um, and majesty of nature is everything is so intricately complicated that there's ripples on ripples on ripples on ripples. Yeah. Um, next question comes from Nick Ledley. Um, question is what can be done at the local level to limit declines in migratory bird populations? What can we all do in our backyards and uh, in close to home? Whole bunch of things. Um, uh, garden with native plants to, to the greatest extent that you can. And particularly um, if you can plant 
native berry producing, fruit producing shrubs, high, high value shrubs like native viburnums, native dogwoods, spice bush, you know, plants that are going to provide um, a high fat load for birds like, oh, you know, thrushes and tanagers and, and, uh, and catbirds as they're getting ready to migrate. Um, if you have a cat, keep it inside. Um, even if you don't think your cat catches birds, your cat catches birds. Um, and if your community is going to start one of these managed cat colonies, trap, neuter, and release colonies, um, scream bloody murder to stop them from doing it because they just become a black hole for birds. If you're a coffee drinker, I would urge you to seek out and buy Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center certified bird-friendly coffee. And you can, you can, there's a bunch of places you can buy that online. You can get it in supermarkets. Whole Foods sells it. Um, the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center Bird Friendly Coffee. I have seen firsthand the impact this has on small coffee farms in Central America, these traditional rustic shade coffee farms that are incredibly good habitat for migratory songbirds. In places like the highlands of northern Nicaragua, which I've visited a number of times, the premium price the farmers are getting is allowing them to buy up old degraded cattle pastures and grain fields and replant it with native forest vegetation you know, to create new coffee farms, but it's new, it's, they're creating bird habitat down there, superb bird habitat. Um, you know, that's a really simple way to make a big impact for migratory birds. And get involved at the local level in land use decisions. Um, you know, with your, with your local town, they have a conservation commission, they have a planning commission, keep up on what's going on there. Um, you know, do everything you can to, um, to limit destructive development, um, you know, and vote you know, vote, vote nature. I would also say support organizations like NRCM that are doing, doing the hard work in places like Augusta. Well, thank you very much, Scott. And uh, I think that's a good place to, to end it there on a, on a high note. Um, so uh, just a couple of reminders from this program. Uh, we did record this afternoon's webinar and you'll all receive an email tomorrow with a link to watch that webinar uh, on YouTube. And we encourage you to share that with friends and family who are unable to join us here today. Um, certainly encourage all of you to uh, pick up a copy of Scott's new book uh, and his past books as well, uh, and implement some of the suggestions that he just made in your life to help uh, help birds recover. Um, Allison, anything else to add before we sign off here today? No, I do hope that you'll share that link broadly with, um, with your friends and family who didn't get to tune in with us today because Scott's message was fantastic. Really enjoyed every moment of it, Scott. Thank you for being here with us and sharing this. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Thanks again, Scott. And have a good afternoon, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.